So today what we're going to be doing is taking a look at uh, a few different ways of calculating electric field for charge distributions. So rather than just looking at point charges, which we've already done, we're going to be looking at charge distributions. All right, let me get this going. All right. So we'll start off with some definitions of some different things that we'll be looking at, which again, we've said that the charge is being distributed over space now in this case, rather than just into a single location. So we'll start off by defining uh, some equations or some uh, charge density things here as we look at this. So the first one that we're gonna have here is a linear charge density, where you have charge that's distributed across a line. And so rather than having all of the charge focused at single points, point charges, what we're gonna do now is we're taking a calculus approach. We're looking at, rather than single point charges, an infinite number of tiny point charges spaced out along a line. This would be a linear charge density. And we have a symbol for this that we use. It is the lowercase Greek letter lambda. Conveniently, it's the Greek letter L for linear charge density. Lambda tells us uh, the amount of charge per length inside some sort of line of charge. If you have a wire that you're charged up, it would tell you how much charge there is per length of the wire. And so the way that we can write this in terms of uh, Calculus would be dq dx. The amount of charge per length. Does this make sense? So the next one we're going to look at is a surface area charge density. And the symbol that we use for a surface charge or surface area charge density. And this would be if you have like a, a, a rectangular sheet of charge, or if you have like a, a sphere and there's only charge on the outer surface of it, then all of the charge is being distributed as a amount of charge per square meter or per surface area unit in that case. And so what we have for this, well, the symbol that we use, it's another Greek letter. Surface area starts with an S. Then we go with the Greek letter sigma looks like a, you know, like an O with a baseball cap or something. And sigma tells you the charge per area, or dq dA. All right. And the last one that we're going to look at here is the uh, volumetric charge density. This would be if you have a three-dimensional object that has charge distributed all throughout it, then we would get a volumetric charge density. And for this, we use the symbol uh, rho, because I guess volume starts with a r. And as we look at it, in this case, rho is just the symbol that we use for this. It's a historical reason. This is dq dv, the amount of the charge per volume. All right. So yes, you may have heard some whisperings around here. This is multivariable calculus, kind of. But uh, we, we pretend to do it as one dimensional calculus in here. And so you'll see the approaches that we use in here that will be different from what you guys would have done in uh, Calc 3. But you can do it whichever way you'd like. I'm going to show you guys a one dimensional approach for all of these things. So the first thing we're going to start off with is let's say that we have a solid disk of charge. All right. So it's going to be a disk that has charge all throughout it. And what we want to figure out is the total amount of charge that's on this disk. And what we know is the surface area charge density. So in general, these could be constants. And for most problems that we do, they will be constants because it just makes the math a little easier if they're constants. But they don't have to be a constant. It could be a function. And so that's what we're going to start off with. 
let's say, because if it was just a disk, and we knew that sigma was the surface area charge density, and it was constant, we take the area and multiply by sigma, and that would tell us the total amount of charge. Does that make sense? It would just be 2 pi, or pi r squared times sigma, and that would be the total charge. But let's say, for uh, argument's sake, that we have a disk, and it's not uniformly charged, but the charge changes with radius. So we'll draw this out, and we'll take a look at it. Let's say we've got a disk, okay, and from the center, this has a radius of capital letter R. And what we're going to say is that sigma is going to be a function of R, and let's say that it's equal to some constant. Uh, I guess we'll just go with I'll just use a capital letter B here, the constant, times R. So as we get farther and farther out, there's more and more charge. So most of the charge is located around the outside, but there's still some charge in the middle and all throughout the disk. It's just it gets more and more charge as we go outwards. Does this make sense? Okay. So what we're going to do is take a look at this, and we're going to try to add up all of the bits of charge. So we can think about is little bits of dq charge, and if we add them all up, all the little bits of dq, then we get the total charge. So basically what we've got is this. Q is going to be equal to the integral of dq, if we add up all the bits of charge. So we're thinking about breaking it up into infinitely many tiny little bits of charge, and then adding them all up together to get the total amount of charge. Does this make sense so far? Okay. So what we're going to do in this case is I'm going to actually draw... Uh, a bit of a zoom in on this, but let's just imagine that we have a single radius in here, like this, like some smaller radius, radius that's smaller than capital letter R. Do we agree that everywhere on that hoop, or that loop around, that this will actually be constant? So for a given radius, anywhere around the circle, the value of sigma would be constant. If it was a different radius, a smaller ring or a larger ring, then it would have a different value. But as long as we're on that loop, we're going to have the same value everywhere throughout. So what we're going to do is I'm going to take this loop, and I'm going to make one that's just a little bit bigger, infinitesimally bigger. And we're going to get a very thin hoop. So rather than a disk, we're going to get a very thin hoop. And if we've got a bunch of these, and we stack them all up, we'll actually get the full disk. Does that make sense? And so, you know, it's a little bit thinner than this, because it's infinitely thin. But it's just a visual model here. So I'm going to do like a bit of a zoom in on the circle. If this is our circle, like this, and we've got this sort of stripe here along the way. It's our, a bit of a circle. And then we move just very bit, a little bit outwards from there. And we wind up with this thin band that goes all the way around, sort of where this dotted line is on the figure. Does this just make sense so far? That is our DQ. That thin loop, the amount of charge in that is going to be the dq that we're going to be using in this equation. So what we need to look at is how big is that? How much charge is in that dq right there? So what we need to first figure out is what's the area of this little tiny ring. So how, let's start off. Let's say that we take this ring, we grab our scissors, cut the ring at the top, unfold it. Now we have a rectangle. What's the length of the rectangle? 2 pi r, the circumference of the circle. Does that make sense? And then the thickness is this thickness between there, which is dr. It's how much we go outwards from here to there. This would be dr. So the actual area, the little bit of area that this dq has in it, we'll call it dA for a small bit of area of the total area, is going to be the circumference times dr. So in that case, it's going to be 2 pi r dr. And so this is one of the steps that we've got for this as we're looking at this. It's going to be 2 pi r dr. That's dA. Now, it's one of those things where, again, we're doing these steps, and it doesn't necessarily seem obvious why we're doing them yet, but we'll get there in just a minute. The main reason is because you can't just integrate dq. So we need to write it in a way that it's an integral that we can actually perform. So let's take a look over here. We know that sigma is equal to dq over dA. And so dq is just going to be equal to sigma times dA. Does that make sense? 
So that's what we're going to replace dq with, sigma times dA. And then what we can do is we can plug in dA, 2 pi r dr, and we can plug in sigma, sigma, which is b times r. So we're going to plug both those things into here, and then we'll have an, an integral that we can actually evaluate. I'm going to bring it over here just because I, I'm running out of room in this part. So we have here is that the total charge, qt, is going to be equal to the integral of sigma b times r times 2 pi r dr. If we rewrite this, and I'll just do it here just to save space, we wind up with 2 pi b r squared dr. Now, let's think about the limits of this. We need to make sure we include all of the charges. So what values of r do all of the charges have if we include all of the charges? Yeah, 0 to big r. And so that's going to be our limits of integration here so that we know that we include all of the charges in the problem. We're going to integrate from 0 to capital R. Are we following this setup so far? Do we have questions about it? Okay. Well then, let's actually perform this integral. Go ahead and do it. 2 pi b, those are all constants. You can just pull them out. All right, so this is going back to what we've done before. You can just take the integral of that. It then becomes r cubed over 3. Plug in r, plug in 0, subtract the 2, and you wind up with 2 thirds pi b r squared. This would be the total amount of charge on this disk. This is not something that you can calculate or figure out any other way other than just doing it this way by a calculus. Because it's something that's varying as a function of distance. You could do it approximately by doing it calculus approximations, but you couldn't get an exact value without doing it this way. And this is why something, this is why we started it today looking at calculus rather than before when we were just doing electrostatics using algebra. And a little bit of trick. All right, so this is the sort of basic idea to figure out charge density and use charge density to answer questions about how much charge is on an object. Now what we're going to do is sort of look at this and combine it with the idea of electric field to calculate the electric field around objects that have distributed charges. So that's what we're going to do next. I'm going to erase this, and we're going to get going with electric field calculations now. So far, I'm following. Good. This is one of the things where I like at this point in the year, because people who are currently taking calculus now have enough for me to just like do an integral, and you know what it means, and I don't, we're not like just going through the motions, but you actually understand the idea behind what the integral is. Whereas when we were doing this earlier in the year, I think it was a bit of just, you know, going through the motions. Whereas now, hopefully, it actually makes a little bit more sense. Definitely not a formula you should know. No, that's specifically for that one example. That'll never come up again. Yeah. But that was just an example of showing you how, if you had an equation for the... Uh, the charge density, you could integrate that along with that dA part. And that dA part we'll use again, but the rest of it we won't necessarily use again. Alright, so the first example we're going to look at is a line of charge. So we're going to set up a coordinate system here. We've got an xy coordinate system, and there's an origin right here. And what we're looking for is what's the electric field at the origin? That's the, what we're trying to solve in this example. Now, what I'm going to do is at this point here and out to this point over here, we have a charge, a line of charge. And so we'll give this, it's going to be a constant uniform charge density, so it's just lambda the whole way. It's got a length of L. 
this distance from here to here is a distance of A. And we want to know what's the electric field at the origin. Yeah. So we're going to go through this and set this up the way we've done it before. But what we're going to do is we're going to, once again, break this up into little tiny chunks. So let's take a look. If we, say, slice this up into a little bit right here, this would be our dq, a little bit of the charge, of the total charge, an infinitely small proportion of the total charge. And that varies all along the length of this wire. We can move dq. dq is a distance of x away from the origin. We've conveniently placed our coordinate system so that it makes the math a little easier. Now, let's take a moment to think about the direction of the electric field at this point. Let's assume that the charges are positive for lambda. What direction is the electric field here? This way, right? Because if these are all positive at this point here, it would be repelled if it was positive charge as well. So the electric field is going to be pointing to the left. And here's one of the things that's nice about this, is not only is the net electric field to the left, but every single electric field from every single dq is straight to the left. Does that make sense? So we can actually ignore all the vector stuff when we're talking about electric field for this problem because every single point charge that makes up this line points in the exact same direction. So I'm going to write down for you the equation for the electric field that's created by this little tiny bit of charge. So what we say is it's going to make part of the electric field, a little bit of it, dE, that's some small portion of the electric field, that's going to be equal to k dq over r squared. And this electric field is a vector, so it is going to be pointing in the direction of r. So we use r hat to notate it's in the direction of r. So in this case, since r is this way, from this point to the electric field, that's why the electric field is in that direction as well. But for this problem, we're really only looking at the x component, so we can ignore that vector part of things. We're going to ignore the vector part of this, because we already know they're all in the same direction. So we do stuff like this. We're going to be looking at symmetrical charge distributions, things where stuff cancels out, things where the math isn't too messy. It gets a little messy, but not too bad. So for this one, I'm going to get rid of that r hat part of things. But this is the formula we'll use generally when we're setting up these kinds of problems. Let's get rid of that. And this is what we're going to be using for this right now. If we take the integral of both sides of this, we would get the total electric field. But first we need to figure out how the heck are we going to integrate with respect to dq. And we can't, so we're going to replace it once again. And here, since we have a linear charge density, and we just said lambda is equal to dq over dx, we can say that dq is going to be lambda times dx. Does that make sense? Yes, no, maybe? Okay. So with dq, we're going to replace that with lambda times dx. It's going to be k lambda over, and since r is the distance between dq and the point, that's just x everywhere for here. So we're going to replace r with x in this case as well, because that's the distance. It's going to be over x squared dx. And that's going to be equal to dE, some little bit of electric field from this one single bit of charge. And if we add all of them together, if we take the integral of both sides, we get the total electric field. So let's do that. What we get is e is going to be equal to this integral. Now let's take a moment to think about limits. What should the limits of integration be here? Take a second, think about it, see if you can come up with what the limits of integration should be for this integral. We want to make sure we include everywhere where there's charge. A to L? Is that what you think? It's A to A plus L. Yeah. We start here from A, we go to A plus L, because that's the x coordinate of this location and of this location here. Does that make sense? Questions? All right, so let's go ahead. Let's evaluate this. Go for it. 
K and lambda are both constants. You can pull them out if you wish, or just leave them there as you take them. There's a negative that comes out from the interval, and so I flipped it. I flipped the bounds. The other thing about this as well is we're talking about a magnitude. We already know what direction it's in, and so positive or negative in this only comes out to be a magnitude, or uh, would be the direction. We already know what the proper direction is, so we can be a little careless with signs and just say at the end it's got to be a positive number. So we can just take the absolute value to get a negative number. But if you're taking care with signs, this is what you get as your answer. You've got a negative on the outside, and these are backwards. Yeah, yeah. So it's the same thing. What? So what happens here as we take the antiderivative? We increase the exponent of this, and then we divide by the new exponent, which would be negative one. So we're going to divide by the new negative one. All right. So this is a valid formula for the electric field here at this point, away from those. Now. If instead of giving, being given, uh, well, actually, we'll do just a little bit more work with this to, I think, pretty it up just a bit. So we're going to actually do the subtraction of these. So we need to get similar denominators. So we're going to multiply this one by a plus l over a plus l, and this one by a over a. And then you can put them together, right? And so we get a plus l minus a on the top. Make sense? And so what we get here is k lambda. L over A times A plus L. And I think that looks a little nicer. The other thing with this, the way write, uh, writing it this way, is we actually now have K, or we have lambda times L, which you may or may not recognize is just Q, the total charge. And so you could write this as KQ. over a times a plus l. Which I think is pretty cool that this equation comes out pretty darn close to Coulomb's law. It's kq over two distances multiplied together. And the two distances are the two ends of the rod. So it's like r squared, but now we just know there's two different r's, one at either end of the rod that are being multiplied together. Kind of a neat way to view this and see it there all written out. Now, something to think about with this. What happens if, uh, oh wait, did I drop? No. Oh yeah, so A is the distance that you are from it. So if A, A is sort of the value that we're, that we're changing here, and L as well. So if you increased L, if you made L to be infinite, then you'd have an infinitely long wire, and you would just get the calculation for how far away you are from that. Uh, or if you made, uh, a large, if so that A was much larger than L. Well, if you look at the equation, if A is much larger than L, then this basically just turns back into KQ over A squared, which was Coulomb's law. So like, if you get far away from a, a rod of that's charged, it basically just acts like a point charge. Because if you're far enough away, basically all of the charges are the same distance away from you. And so that's one of those things that we'll see and, and kind of get to understand as we go through. So if it's infinitely far away. Then, then basically it would be zero. But even if it's just much farther away than the length that the rod is, then it's pretty close to just, you can just use Coulomb's law to approximate what you would get in that case. Awesome. All right, so we're gonna look at now a different example. We've got two more that we're gonna go through today in the time we got left. The first one is going to be just a ring of charge. This is one that actually I think we've already done in here previously. We're gonna go back through it here and look at it from a uh, slightly different perspective, which is, here, once again, a ring of charge, and we're looking on axis of the ring. So 
along the central axis, that's what we're going to be calculating. So just keep this in mind as I draw it up on the board for you. Both of these derivations are ones that you would could be expected to do. They have been on AP tests in the past. So if this is our center line there, we've got an axis that goes off this direction. If we're looking for the electric field at this point here, we can calculate it using a similar method. So let's get started. Each little bit of electric field provided by this thing is going to be equal to okay, dq over r squared in the r hat direction. So that means for this little bit of dq up here, the little bit of electric field is going to be pointing like this. That's going to be its de vector. Does that make sense? Because that's our length. But what direction do we expect the electric field to be at this point here? Yeah, straight to the right. And the reason why is because for every bit of dq, there's a second dq that's exactly on the opposite side of the ring here. And its electric field is going to go this way. And so the components that aren't along the axis all get canceled out. Here it's got an upwards and a downwards one. But if you were thinking about your ring of charge, so if rather than using the top and bottom one, where they're going to go this way and this way, if you're using the side ones here and here, then they're going to be going this way and this way. And so any of the components that point in this direction, outwards, radially outwards, those are going to cancel out. And anything, only the ones that are in this direction are going to contribute positively to one another. Does that make sense? Yep. Does this work with a traditional phase configuration of one term? Like if you have like a square? Or... It does not. Uh, it, de it depends on the symmetry of the situation. Uh, you might be able to, yes, so if you had like a square you're talking about on axis and it's a symmetrical shape, mm -hmm. uh, you could, you can still make that argument. Yeah. Because uh, you can always pair it up with one opposite that would cancel out the components. If it's non-symmetrical in that way, then no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. All right. So we can say instead of doing this vector form, we can just, once again, just look at D, E, the X component. And we'll just ignore this part here. And we define this angle here as theta. Well, then we'd have to look at this as a, what, cosine theta. And then this is now the correct expression for what we're looking for. This makes sense so far? Now what we're integrating this with respect to is, well, we want to include all of the charges. So it's not really anything that we have in there yet. So we're going to need to rewrite quite a bit of this here. We're going to replace dq. Well, actually, before we do that, let's replace r. R is the distance from dq, the charge, to this point, which is, I guess I'll define the radius of this to be a, just using a here for arbitrary lengths. And so the radius, the distance between this point and that point is going to be square root of a squared plus x squared, or x squared plus a squared. So let's go ahead and rewrite that part. Okay q over the square root of a squared plus x squared, but that's square. So it's just a squared plus x squared. Make sense? And then we got to re rewrite the cosine theta. And cosine theta in general is equal to, when you think about Sokotoa, it's the adjacent over the hypotenuse, right? So in this case, the adjacent side is x, the hypotenuse side is root a squared plus x squared. So we can replace cosine with x over root a squared plus x squared. That makes sense? Following so far. Then we just multiply everything together. I guess I'll write this as kx dq. u over a squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power on the bottom. 
And this is equal to DES, the little bit of horizontal electric field from one of these little DQs around the outside of the ring. Does that make sense? So here's the thing. Now what we need to do is just add them all up. But one thing to notice is every single charge is the same diagonal distance from this point. X doesn't depend on which charge we pick. R doesn't change depending on which X we, which charge we pick, which DQ we pick. Nothing in this equation depends on which DQ we pick. These are all constant for everything. So really all we're going to do is replace DQ with Q because everything else is a constant with respect to each of the charge's locations. So that's one of these little tricks that we can do is to say, well, every charge is the same distance away. So we can just replace DQ with Q. And that's what we do here is we get that the electric field is going to be equal to k q x over a squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. And I guess if you wanted to do this as a vector, it's to the right, so it would be in the positive x hat direction. Questions here? Okay. I'm going to rewrite this over here. We're going to use this to get one more. Now, I hope I haven't lost you, lost you yet. Because the next one goes just a, a little step further. We're going to combine some of the things we did. Basically, that first thing we did where we broke up the, uh, the, the solid disk into a bunch of little rings, what we're going to do now is rather than looking at a ring, we're going to look at a solid disk of charge. And so this solid disk of charge is going to have some sort of sigma. And it's going to be uniform this time, so it's going to be a constant uh, charge density. But what we're going to do is look at it and see if we can figure out what the electric field is on axis of a disk of charge instead of a hoop of charge. So you may wish to redraw the same drawing again, because we're using it now for a hoop, a solid, a solid disk instead of a hoop. And I'm going to erase this, because we're going to get started again looking at this one more time. So what we're going to do is break this up into small rings, like we did with that first problem. Break it up into a bunch of little rings, starting from the center, working our way all the way out to the outside. And we're going to add up all of the little bits of electric field, which we just calculated what the amount of electric field is from one of these rings, one of these DQs. And so this is the electric field from one of those little DQs. So that's what we're going to start off with once again. So let's get started with this one. We've got that the total electric field, or one little bit of the electric field, is going to be equal to k x dq over a squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. And we're going to integrate that in just a bit. But first, we've got to get rid of this pesky dq. So let's get started with that. Let's get rid of dq. So once again, we had this equation from before. We said that dA was going to be 2 pi r dr. We got that from this drawing over here, where we said, you know, if we're looking at some sort of band inside of here with thickness dr, we get that the area of that band is 2 pi r dr. So we get this once again. dA is equal to 2 pi are. And we also know that uh, dq, in this case, is going to be equal to sigma times dA. So dq can be replaced with 2 pi r sigma dr. 2 pi sigma r dr. All right, so that's what I'm replacing dq with on the top. What we get here on the top is 2 pi k sigma r x. I guess I'll write that in the other order just for uh, r dr. It's a big, a large uh, numerator in this fraction. But basically what I've done is I've taken k and x, and then I've multiplied by 2 pi r dr times sigma. So I'm just replacing dq. 
so far. And then on the bottom, well, since now we're not just dealing with a single radius of a hoop, we're actually varying the radius of the hoop as we take this integral. We're adding up a whole bunch of little bits of this disk. We're going to use r instead of a because that radius is changing, and we're going to integrate with respect to r. Hopefully you're following along here. If you're not, at least write it down so that you can follow it later. And then on the bottom, we've got r squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power. And now we have something that we can integrate, kind of. You'll be able to integrate this shortly, once I point a couple things out. All right. Yeah, a lot of them are constants. So let's go ahead and pull the constants out. So if we integrate this side, dE, we just get the total electric field. And on this side, let's pull all of the constants out that we're not going to use. Well, let's pull out a pi, a k, sigma. x is a constant in this case, even though it's a variable in the equation. It doesn't depend on r. So as we change the radius that we're integrating over, each individual dq is still the same distance x away. So we can pull x out of it because it's a constant with respect to r. We'll pull out x as well. And what we're left with on the inside is 2r over r squared plus x squared to the 3 halves power dr. Does that look like something we can do? We're getting there. Looks closer, at least. All right, let's do a use substitution. I've been told you guys know how to do this now. So what we're going to say is that u, let u be equal to r squared plus x squared. And the variable that we're using here, I know there's an x in this equation. Just ignore the x. The x isn't a variable that we're dealing with in this case. We're going to take the derivative of both sides. On one side, we're going to basically we're going to take the derivative of du dr. So we're taking the derivative of this with respect to r, and what we get is that du is going to be equal to 2r dr. And x doesn't change with respect to r, so it's just a constant. It just goes to zero when we take the derivative of x squared with respect to r. So now we have a great little thing right here. We already have a 2r dr right there. So that's du over u to the 3 halves power. It's a little easier now. Pi k sigma x integral of u to the negative 3 halves du. So go ahead and do that. Oh yeah, I guess I didn't define the bounds on the previous integral. So let's let's actually step back one step here. Look at this integral here. What are the bounds? What are the values that we're going to integrate from r to along r? It's for a full disk. So we're going from zero, the center of the disk, all the way to the outer side edge of the disk, capital R. So that's just a step in here. If you really want to, you can redefine your bounds in terms of u, but I never like to do that. Uh, I prefer to just plug back in and, and do it at the end. Would you put R first, or would you put A? What? Would you put A instead of R? No, uh, I'm I'm going to use, in this case now, okay. capital letter R, and we'll say that this has a uh, charge density of sigma. I guess I didn't really get those in the beginning. Yeah, if you were using A, you could use A. But this is another one that's traditionally just done with a capital R in this case. All right, so when you take the integral of this u to the minus 3 halves power, you should get u to the minus 1 half power divided by negative 1 half. And so you wind up with, down here, pi k sigma x times negative 2 over the square root of u. That makes sense? And then what we can do is evaluate this. Well, well, we'll substitute back in for u and then evaluate it. So I'll write this one more time. Pi k sigma x times. And now this is uh, on the top 
we'll keep the negative two. Well, or actually, I'm, well, I guess it's fine. We'll keep it. Then divide by the square root of r squared plus x squared. And we're evaluating this from 0 to capital R. And so I'll flip the limits because I've got a negative in there. And so I'll plug in 0 first, subtract, plugging in R from it. And what we get is pi. Well, I'll pull the 2 out as well, just so that this all the constants are together. Uh, 2 pi k sigma x times the quantity. Uh, 1 over x minus 1 over the square root of x squared plus r squared. And this is our formula here. This one doesn't get much prettier, but it works. I guess there is one thing that we can actually do to make this just a little bit nicer looking, which would be actually distribute in the x. So let's go ahead and do that. If we distribute in the x, we wind up with this just being 1. And this then becomes x over that. I like that just a little bit better. And this is our formula for that. Now, this is a calculation that I think you should be able to do, but I don't think you will be asked to do this yourself independently not on an AP test or on another assessment in here. You might be asked to do it on a worksheet in class or a homework assignment or something like that. But uh, for the homework tonight, you'll just be asked to apply these three formulas that we've derived in class today. You won't be asked to derive them necessarily. But I would suggest actually looking through these over the weekend and seeing if you can do these derivations. Like I said, look through it, set the notebook aside, and try to write them out. Because if you do that, that will help you be very successful in doing this kind of problem going forward. So I would highly suggest giving that a go if you can. Now, what we're going to talk just a little bit about is with these equations. What do we get if we look at the boundary condition? So what that means is if we change some of the values to be either 0 or infinity, what do we get that's different? So let's take a look at this one right here. If we make, uh, if we make the radius r equal to 0, what do we get? You actually just get zero. And the reason why is because if it's a point charge and it has a surface area charge density, well, it doesn't have any surface area, so there's not going to be any electric field. But what if we make R infinite? So let's think, rather than just having a, a, a disk of charge, it's an infinite plane of charge. It goes on forever. R would then be infinite. So x over infinity is, well, it's, it's infinity squared is what? Zero. zero. So this whole term here just goes to zero, and it's just one times this, and you get just two pi k sigma. And that is the value, so if you have a sheet of charge that's big enough that like your distance from it is much less than the actual size of the charge, of the sheet of charge, that's the equation for it, two pi k sigma. Now, in the next unit, we're going to show a much easier way to get to that answer. <laughs> at least this part, the part within this. Now, as I said, this method, the way that we're using it, requires a good bit of symmetry. You need your, your stuff that you're measuring to be highly symmetrical. Uh, but that's just for it to come out nice, for it to come out cleanly, which this is about as clean as some of these ones come out. And if you tried to do this, if you tried to look at, like, if you had a disk of charge and you wanted to figure out what the electric field was here, that's a whole heck of a mess. You can do it. It's perfectly doable. But it just takes a lot of work to do it. That's some of the stuff I did in like my physics 435 class in uh, for electricity and magnetism, or 436. I don't remember which one we did that. But those were, those were actually some of my favorite uh, physics classes at university. And we did those sorts of questions where we're doing those weird different places. It's just a lot of calculation, but you certainly can do it. Now, what we're going to do next unit is we're going to be looking at a different method which is a much easier method, like it's, it's in terms of the calculus, it's much more straightforward, but it requires not just 
highly symmetrical, but like incredibly symmetrical charge distributions. To the point that like you can do it for three or four things, and other than that, it's basically not a useful technique. But for these simple charge distributions, it's incredibly powerful because it lets you do them with just really small bits of calculus and work. And it will tell you what the electric field is at all these different locations. So we're going to look at that next unit. Uh, I think this unit will probably be wrapping up by the end of next week, something like that. Because it's like everything we've done now so far this whole year at this point. So we'll be doing a couple more of these, looking at electric fields. We'll come back and look at it with potential as well, the same sort of thing. And it's a, it's a little easier with potential because potential doesn't have components. And so you can just add them all up. You don't have to worry about any vectors or any vector issues. Um, and then once we've got that, then we're basically done for this unit. We'll do some practice next week, and then we'll have a test probably by the end of next week. All right. I think that's all I've got for you today. Feel free to pack things up. <laughs>